What the heck happened today? Because treasury yields skyrocketed. Now, this all of a sudden means that the Federal Reserve has actually loosened interest rates by 50 basis points. They're now essentially 100% likely to give us another 25 basis point cut. Even Nick T reiterates that, which means they will have loosened policy, monetary policy within the next week by 75 basis points. And what did the market do in the face of the Federal Reserve loosening monetary policy by 75 basis points? Keep in mind, they're loosening policy to try to motivate hiring. So as the Fed is loosening to motivate hiring, what actually happened in markets? What actually happened was yields went up by 75 basis points. This is insane. And I found why. In this video, we're going to break down why, whether this is a long-term concern or this is destined to correct, and how there might be a potential to play it from an investment POV. Oh, and before we get into it, remember tonight is coupon code expiration night. So go to meetkevin.com, join the courses, join me in the course member live streams every single morning when we go through fundamental analysis, discuss trading and fundamentals and investing and any other questions you got. Well, let's get started. All right. So in order to start this, I'm going to roll over here. And we're going to start with this ISM report, uh, which is the uh, PMI, Purchaser Managers Index, uh, from the uh, ISM, uh, Institute for Supply Side Management. Now, this is a really important report because this report helped contribute to the yield spike today because prices paid spiked. And so we saw manufacturing weakening, uh, weaken again, but then prices paid. When this report came out, that prices paid spike. People again started the trade, which has been popular amongst the Trump trade as well, that says, oh, okay, we're going to have stagflation or longer-term inflation. Therefore, the longer end of the yield curve is going to go up. At first glance, that sounds logical. But when you actually look at the details, it is deeply flawed. Let's first understand what's actually in some of the portions of the report. Promise I won't read you all of it. Let's keep it simple. First, U.S. manufacturing activity contracted again in October and at a faster rate compared to last month as demand continues to weaken. This is not good. This is how recessions begin. Output declined. Input stayed accommodative. Now, this is actually really important. I want you to remember this for a moment. Inputs stayed accommodative, meaning that even if input prices go up, they're still accommodative to manufacturing. But in the face of that accommodation, demand continues to be weak, which is really bad. But nobody actually reads the reports. People just read the headline, make a trending trade because, well, that's the way markets are trading. And you know what they end up doing? They end up creating speculative frenzies that are frankly misplaced and are probably going to lead to a massive correction. In fact, one of the favorite things that I'm doing right now is, uh, in addition to getting my Halloween green off, <laughs> is I am reading on uh, one of these Kindles, hashtag not sponsored, uh, but I'm reading, I love how easy it is to read on this, but I'm reading uh, uh, securities analysis again, and I love this line right here. You ready for him? It is always difficult to approach a contrarian approach. Oh, it is always difficult to take a contrarian approach. Even highly capable investors can wither under the relentless message from the market that they are wrong. You need to have balls of steel to hodl because the pressures to succumb are enormous. Okay, I may have added the balls of steel part, but the pressures to the succumb part is there. And this is important because look at the data. Panelists continue to cite efforts by companies to right-size their workforces. Okay, wait a minute. So accommodative input price conditions, demand slowing, there are continued pressures to right-size workforces, which means more layoffs. I want you to add this together for a moment, okay? Add this together. Well, let's just write it right here for a moment, okay? Uh, right-size employment, layoffs, that's recessionary, right? Accommodative inputs, oh, there's an extra M there, I gotta spell it correctly, there you go. Accommodative inputs, what does that mean? It means 
you should have plenty of capability uh, of producing whatever uh, and and what's the next thing well weak demand which is also recessionary all of these things point to the same things that we've been seeing at companies. Companies have been regularly com complaining about this. It's not a, a matter of supply chains, with the exception of certain AI chips, being so tight anymore. It's a matter of demand broadly in the economy that's failed. Here's some quotes, right sizing continues, and we're going to talk about prices in just a moment. Market demand has significantly increased in the second, uh, sorry, significantly decreased in the second half, well, that's not good. We, we don't want to see that. Uh, and is expected to be soft through the first quarter of 2025. Don't even get me started with how 2025 is going to look. General pessimism in the economy is driving customers to be more restrictive. Business is picking up, but not great. Uh, that's in computers and equipment products. Sales have been very slow the past six months, though inquiries are up more than 30%. This indicates pent-up demand, but people are skittish. Business levels remain depressed as people are in this wait-and-see environment. More quotes over here, report strikes, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now I want you to get to this category. This is the prices paid category, and this is really important. Watch this. Raw material prices increased in October after decreasing the month before. Energy and transportation costs, which transportation costs are directly related to oil and gas prices, were the, what was that, secondary driver, tertiary driver? No, they were the primary driver. The primary driver in why the prices paid index expanded was energy with, it literally says, crude oil and natural gas increasing somewhat, offset by weakness in steel. So like materials, a lot of materials actually went down, but it was energy that went up. Now, wait a minute. Can we see those energy prices on a chart so we can get a better picture of what's going on? Absolutely. In fact, I pasted it right here on purpose because this is where ISM says that these surveys go out at the first part of every month. Some companies respond right at the beginning of the month. The majority of them respond right at the end of the month or late in the month to give the best picture on pricing. Okay, well, what happened in October? Well, this right here is the price of oil at the beginning of the month. And this right here is the price of oil at the end of the month. Compare that to where you were in September, where all of September, it was basically lower than where we were in October. So no duh, there was an increase in prices paid driven by oil. But this was not driven by the economy, you know, stagflating. This was driven by fears that Israel was about to go to nuclear war with Iran. And don't get me wrong, they're still playing tit for tat. But holy smokes, those fears have substantially quelled. And that's why oil's down at 73 on Brent. So in other words, what are you left with? Okay, well, you're left with, like, think about this for a moment. The market says prices paid up stagflation. That's what the market is saying. Okay, but if you actually look at the data, the data, the data, the data, if you actually look at the data, what is it actually telling you? It's telling you things are slowing, employment down, supply available, demand low for whatever reason, election demand, you know, uncertainty, whatever the reason is, these are recessionary indicators. And as yields go up, all you're actually doing is increasing the odds of recession, which is crazy. Because you're doing the opposite, quite frankly, of what you should be doing. Now, I want to also show you something that is pretty important as well. And it is this misunderstanding of what's going on with the jobs data. Now, I already broke down the jobs report this morning. So you already know my opinion on that, uh, which is that it's bad. Okay, The household survey is basically undoing uh, the, the excitement that we had last month. Okay, The August and September revisions... Are bad. August, basically, we only created 78,000 jobs, which is terrible. That is almost a third of what our normal run rate is around 188 to 190,000 jobs. Okay. So, really bad. September was really hot, but now it's starting to come in negative, and the household survey is coming in negative as well. Now, why does it matter that the household survey is coming in negative? Because I want, I wrote this in red right here. 
striking workers. Remember, we had strikes at the beginning of October and we had hurricanes. Striking workers are still counted as employed on the household report as long as they expect to return to work at some point. The same is true for hurricanes. As long as they're expected to return to work, uh, then they are counted on the household report. Now, if a business was completely destroyed, then yes, obviously they could show up as, uh, well, quite frankly, being, you know, oopsie doopsied and being counted as fully unemployed because the business was destroyed. But when you look at American Express, this is via Fox News Post, American Express announced a program to help 1,000 businesses located in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and Tennessee that meet eligibility requirements to receive up to $5,000 each. First of all, let me tell you, $5,000 each ain't going to do Jack Hoonies. But, you know, it's a nice little PR move by American Express. But the second thing is, okay, even if you have a thousand small businesses, how many employees do they each have? Five? Ten? We're talking about five or ten thousand employees. Well, how many workers did we lose in the household survey this month? Over 380,000 workers vanished in the household survey, probably because it way overcounted workers in the September report. And now we're adjusting for it. Remember, if it weren't for government workers, we would actually be negative on this unemployment or, or employment report, rather. Okay, fine. So what does T.S. Lombard says? Well, this is the first time, Mr. Stephen Blitz, that I'm vomiting a little bit because I'm like, bro, you're, how lazy do you have to be to put together a document like this? And I generally ex respect T.S. Lombard. And I'm sorry, Stephen, you're probably a nice person. We could probably have an alcohol-free beer or some, you know, coffee together, which reminds me. Oh, boy, I got a long night ahead of me. But, dude, this was just straight up lazy. All right, we're going to go through it one moment. Hold on. This is, an great, this is a great cup to drink from. You have to kind of get him, like, where his ear is. It's, it's weird. All right. Ugh. What can we take away from this hurricane strike addled employment report? Or what we can take away is that the Fed is cutting 25 BP next week and 25 in December. That's all they say. He's basically casting shade on the unemployment report going, oh, well, strikes and hurricanes screwed this one up. And basically, markets are just looking through it going, ah, that was the strike and hurricane report. Dude, did you look at the household survey? No, because you're lazy and you're looking at headline. And the market is being irrationally exuberant. It's, it's fully stupid. And... While this person just casts it aside, what does he argue? Well, the downward adjustments to August and September are meaningful because these are completed surveys, which uh, results more in line with the anecdotes in the September beige report and confirms why the Fed cut 50. Duh. Thank you. So you're acknowledging the weakness. But then what do you do? Then you go on to say, hey, but uh, you know what? Everything's okay because, uh, you know, even though the uh, actual market rates are the ones that really matter when it comes to whether or not the economy is, uh, you know, nearing a recession, uh, it's really important to remember that right now uh, the Fed is cutting rates. And uh, what really matters is not forward pricing. It's actually the cost of real money. That's what really matters. And since the Fed is cutting, we're good. And I'm like, are you fully stupid? Do you realize what you just said? You literally just said, hey, man, it's, it's not really what the Fed's doing that matters. It's what people are actually paying. Have you not looked to see what actual yields have done since the Fed has cut? It's a disaster. It's gone straight up. What are you smoking, buddy? So you're literally telling me, oh, it's, it's everything's OK because the Fed's cutting. People are paying lower rates. No, they're not. They're paying higher rates. Have you seen mortgage rates? This is stupid. Equipment financing rates. You want to go finance a car? Come on, it's all gotten worse. Unless, of course, dealers are doing buy downs, which just eats them in the margin. So now you're basically saying, oh, 50 basis points and another 25 and 25 is going to help. That's the same thing people thought in 2007. This is stupid. And then you make this argument that, oh, well, you know, uh, temporary layoffs are usually a reason for concern. But this time is different because temporary layoffs might not matter as much anymore because 20 to 24 year olds usually align with temporary layoffs. And maybe staffing agencies are just a thing of the past. So we can't really look at this data anymore. And that's why there's this divergence. And I'm like, I don't know, man, they both seem to be trending down together on the right side at almost the same slope. I guess it depends really where you start the slope from, but it doesn't look very good. 
So, point of this being, I think it's a little rough for you to just say this time is different, and even though temporary workers are plummeting and we are seeing more permanent job losers, this idea that we're just going to ignore data that has been very consistently recessionary in the past because this time is different seems a little ludicrous, especially without an acknowledgement of that. Now, with that, it gets even worse because I want you to look at what Bank of America says regarding the flow show and where the crowded trades are. Remember, I told you we talk about where the trades are and what's going on uh, in terms of uh, people's anticipation. So let's go to the flow show, the latest one from Hartnet. And when you look at it, it'll tell you exactly where not to have been an investor basically the last 30 days because they're going to tell you where, frankly, the most unpopular trades have been and essentially where the least crowded trades are and the most contrarian trades. Now, what I personally think is really neat about these is I generally like being the contrarian. And when somebody says nobody is investing in XYZ, it's a sign that I want to be investing in XYZ because that's probably the next trade. You just have to have the balls of steel and a Kindle to respect it. Now, look, I'm not a tech reviewer kind of guy, uh, but if you'd like uh, some tech videos from me, even though I know they'll get like 5,000 views, it's okay out of respect for you. I'm more than happy. Like, I, I have all the little gadgets and stuff. I'm a big fan of productivity. Maybe we could do a productivity video on gadgets and tech. But this is amazing. Uh, I, I, I really have to say, I, I've only had this for like the last, like, I don't know. I think it came in yesterday. Yeah, it did. I don't know why that camera can't focus. Uh, I guess that'll work. I might have it on manual. There you go. This is really cool. That's the off screen, by the way. It sort of keeps it on your book cover. It's awesome. Anyway, all right, you ready for this? Look at this. Zeitgeist. Nobody going into this election, long 30-year treasury, short gold, and short NVIDIA. Well, guess what I just did? I just closed my position that was long gold because I think gold has topped out. I already closed my NVIDIA position, <laughs> and I kind of think it's probably top two. And I may be going long the 20-year so, look, maybe I'm an idiot for doing the contrarian trade, but they literally call it the contrarian trade. The most contrarian trade is buy bonds. Yes. That's because nobody's there, and in my opinion, that's one of the best times to buy. I'm not saying my timing's perfect. It isn't. But I think I'm going to be right in the long term. And in a year from now, people are going to be like, holy smokes, we are dealing with inflation, unemployment, we're probably in the depths of a recession, and bonds are just skyrocketing value. It could be the best trade of 2025. We'll see. Anyway, that's my take. If you want more of my insight every single day, join us in the course member live streams every day over at meetkevin.com. If you have questions or want to bundle up, email us at staff at meetkevin.com. And tomorrow morning, we'll be doing a breakdown live stream for house hike investors. If you have a and a it's the best place to ask me questions. Thanks so much. We'll see you next one. Goodbye and good luck. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take.